we started this series last week on living in freedom. And last week we looked at living in freedom where we talked about from Galatians 1, pleasing God and not pleasing people. And we talked about <clears throat> when we seek validation from others, that causes us to become slaves to their expectations and their opinions. But ultimately, as believers, our goal is to please God and live according to his plans and his purpose. So this week, we're going to go on to chapter 2. And in Galatians 2.20 is, is we're going to look at. And, and, and the series is titled Living in Freedom. And this is Crucify with Christ. And we could also, if we wanted to, we could add in a, another part of, our, of a title. Because you can never have too many titles for your sermon, right? So we add another part of it is, is that we are not defined by our past. Aren't you glad that you're not defined by your past? Aren't you glad that when people see you, you don't have it written on your forehead what was in your past? And so we're going to look at that today. What does it mean uh, when Paul writes in Galatians 2.20? Let's read it together. It says this. It says, for Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This here, this verse is the essence of the Christian life. This is the life that we live that is transformed by the power of the cross. Paul here proclaims that he has been crucified with Christ, indicating a complete and radical identification with Jesus in his death and resurrection. And I want to pause for a minute because before we go any further, the, the, to give greater meaning and greater weight to what Paul says, we've got to remember who Paul was. If we're going to talk about not letting the past determine our future, if we're going to talk about not letting the past hold, have a hold on us, then we should talk about this man and a little bit about his past. Remember, Paul wasn't always Paul. Paul used to be Saul, right? Now, I don't recommend that when you become a believer, you change your name. Now, if you want to change your name like Saul, Saul became Paul, that's okay. So if you've got a really cool name that you'd like to have, and you want to change your name, that's okay. I'll call you, that's, that's good. If you want to go by a different name, that's okay too. Because imagine growing up with the name Stanley. But I kept that name because of my grandpa's name. But Saul, if you look at Saul, we first are introduced to the man named Saul at the stoning of Stephen. <clears throat> Stephen was being stoned for his faith. He was being stoned for preaching in that name, the name of Jesus, that we saw last week disciples were told not to preach in that name. So here we're introduced to a young man named Saul, who it, the Bible says in Acts that he was standing there, and they were laying their coats at his feet while they were stoning Stephen, because it's hard to throw stones at people when you've got a coat on. So obviously you take your coat off to make it better at stoning people. They would lay their coats at Paul's feet, and it, saw, and it says that Saul was giving approval of what was happening. This is the same guy that writes in Galatians 2.20, for I have been crucified with Christ. The same man who just a few years earlier was standing there with people putting their coat at his feet, approving of the stoning to death of a man who followed the Christ that he now says, I've been crucified with. So it's amazing to see the change. And then we see a little bit later that, that Saul was giving papers, given papers by the temple leaders to go into the communities and to round up these believers, and to set on fire their homes, and even to imprison and kill the believers. This is the same man who writes, for I have been crucified with Christ, yet I live. The same one who was crucifying and going after other people, other believers, he now writes, I've been crucified with Christ, yet I live. Not I, but Christ that lives in me. So it's pretty important that we see who this man was that is now writing this letter, and especially this particularly chapter 2, verse 20. So we see what Saul was. So when he's, when he's writing this, we begin, we're, let's take a deeper look at this, because we're going to talk about our past in a few minutes and living in freedom. And he says, I've been crucified with Christ. So what happens to this? We are called to die to ourselves. We are called to die to ourselves. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. See, when we, we're crucified with Christ, the old person, the old you, has to die. And the new self comes to life. That's what he means, I've been crucified with Christ. Jesus said this in John 3, verses 3 to 7. He says, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 
And this is the story of Nicodemus, right? John 3.16 comes to play a little bit later. And Nicodemus says, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter in a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And all the mothers said, thank God for that. Jesus said, truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. When we are crucified with Christ, the old self dies. But the new comes alive. The new comes alive. The new self that is in us. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, yet I live. Right? Yet I live. See, die into oneself. It's important to know this. Uh, dying to oneself is both a one-time event and a lifelong process. Dying to self is both a one-time event and a lifelong process. It's why we see so many people who will come because of trials and tribulations, situations in their life, they'll come to church or they'll make a decision to follow Jesus. And then he begins to, to fix the problem, fix the situation, and then they'll go back to where they were living before. Because in their minds, it was a one-time event. But I mean, no, it's not a one-time event. We have got to live for Christ every day. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say, have the same scripture, the same passage. And so we're going to look at Matthew 16, 24, and 25. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. See, lifelong process, it's a one-time event. We make a decision to follow Jesus. He says, come follow me, and we begin to follow him. But it doesn't stop there. It's every day we've got to make the decision to follow Jesus. And understand this, understand this. Crucifixion means death. When the Romans began the barbaric uh, tradition of crucifying people, it was to exert their power and dominance over the people that they had conquered to make sure that they knew that if they didn't follow Roman law, that they were going to hang on a cross. Even for minor offenses, they didn't care. Because, and they would always hang them like Jesus hung outside of town. As people would walk in and out of town, it was where everybody could see. It wasn't done in private in the back room. So as people walked by, they saw somebody hanging, they, they, they knew. Uh, and everybody, here's, here's what history tells us with the exception of one person. Everybody who was ever crucified died. Only one rose from the dead. But everybody else who's been crucified in Roman history died and were buried, and that was it. So when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, that he's not simply just saying, well, listen, we got to give up stuff. we got to quit doing these things. No, 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 no. What he is saying is when we're crucified with Christ, the old you must die. The old habits must die. The sin must die in our lives. That's what crucifixion means. And so we understand that it's a one-time event. Yes, we make a decision to follow Jesus. We crucify the old flesh. We get rid of the old man. We let the old man go. But we, what we got to do is we got to make sure every day that we're crucifying our flesh. We're crucifying the old person. Because I don't know about you, but the old me was not the most happiest, nicest, best person in the world. And some of you were mean, weren't you? You were mean as a snake. I love hearing stories of some, some of the nicest people in the world, right? And you're like, they're the nicest, kindest, gentlest people. And then they tell you their story, and you're like, there's no way you were like that. There's no way you were mean, right? There's no way you were like that. But that's the transformative power of the cross of Jesus Christ. That it can change us. It can take the meanest sinner and turn them into the nicest saint. Thank God for nice saints. Amen? Amen. It's a one-time event, but it's a lifelong process. And here's something else. It's not optional. It's not optional. Being crucified with Christ is not option. You don't get to, to choose and say, well, I'll give this up, but I'm going to hold on to this. Well, I might give this up a little bit, or maybe I'll just keep a little bit of this. We're going to talk about that a little bit further, too. It's not optional. Revelation 3, 15, 16, Jesus says to the church, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other, but because you were lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. 
See, God, God needs people who are willing to die to themselves every day to live for him. What the world is seeing, especially in our country, in America, Americanized Christianity, is they're seeing a lot of halfway Christianity, giving to Jesus those things that he, he can deal with, but holding on to things that, that we want to hold on to, right? And we see a lot of that, but that's not, it's not optional. If we're going to follow Jesus, we have got to crucify the old person every day. And I, how many of you are glad that the old person doesn't live anymore? Right? Because we, most of us wouldn't even like each other. Right? Most of us would be like, I'm not hanging out with that guy. Do you know what that guy's done? Right? Because of his past. So we're called to die to our old self. Here's the other thing. There's a reality of our union in Christ. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, but I no longer live. Right? That's what crucifixion is. The old you is gone. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So you're not just a shell of yourself. You don't, you don't give up the old self and crucify the old self and then you become like everybody else. No, it's when you are crucified with Christ and Christ begins to live in you, that's when you truly begin to live. That's when you truly become who you are. Your personality comes out. And all, your, all the dreams and goals that God has for you begin to be formed, begin to be, be done in your life because Christ is now living in you. He's living in you. Paul says one verse before, Galatians 2, 19, for through the, through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. So what is Paul saying? He's saying that while he used to live in a state of submission to the law, he now lives as united with Christ in his crucifixion. Listen, the law can't save you. One of the saddest things I see right now is, uh, and we're seeing uh, um, um, more and more cults rising up that are following the Old Testament law right? They, they, they love Jesus, but they're, they're living according to the Old Testament laws. Listen, the law can't save you. In fact, the only thing the law did, if you read Romans, and you read especially chapter 3, the only thing the law could do in the Old Testament was point out your sin. The law can only point out, thou shalt not kill. That doesn't save you. That points out your sin. You shouldn't cover your neighbor's sin. That's not, point, that's not saving you. That's pointing out, that's pointing out your sin. And Paul said, I used to live in submission to the law, but the law couldn't save me. But now I've been crucified with Christ, and I let him live in me. I'm no longer living to the law. I'm living according to Christ and his crucifixion. The results of dying with Christ are essential to our Christian life. I no longer live. I no longer live. Now, we look at the, the letter I, right? The letter I. He says, I no longer live. When I say the word I, who am I talking about? Right? So you, when you say, I am crucified with Christ, but I no longer live with Christ as me, that's the I. The I is the old self. Paul is saying, I no longer live. The old self no longer lives. What's, who's the old self? The old self is that person that was enslaved by sin and controlled by the flesh. That's the old you. Right? Anybody want to go back to that? No. no. Because you're enslaved by sin. The old you can do nothing but sin. That's what sinners do, right? But the new self, we've been, the old self, for us to live and follow Christ, the old self is crucified with Christ. Paul writes in Romans 6 this, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Do you understand what that says? That when we are in Christ, when we have been crucified with Christ, and that we no longer live, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, that sin is done away with. That doesn't mean we're perfect. Now, don't, don't, don't tell you the wrong way. It doesn't mean we're perfect. What it means is he's taken the punishment for the sins that we commit. So sin can be done away with me, and we're no longer slaves to it. Uh, each of us has become a new self in Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 24, he says, and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. When we put on the new self, we become like God. Now, we're not gods. We're not, you know, we're not talking Mormon theology here. Church of Jesus Christ, Latter Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. We're not talking that. We're not going to become gods. But we are becoming more godly because of what he's done in righteousness and how we live our lives God makes us righteous. That's how we live our lives. And so the I 
is done away with. So say this with me. Say, I am, is done away with. The eye is done away with. Some of you did okay. The eye is done away with. Some of you are going to hold on to the eye. So, but listen, listen to what this says here. I want you to get this. When the eye is done away with in Christ, sin is no longer an internal force controlling us. But sin becomes an external power that tempts us and tries to regain control through the flesh and our ten- the sinful tendencies in us. Now listen to what that says. When we are the old person, the old you before Christ, sin was internal force that controlled you. You sinned because that was what, who you were. You were a sinful person. But when we've been crucified with Christ and we have died to the old self and now Christ is living in us, guess what? Sin is no longer an internal power, it's an external force, right? Because sin and Jesus cannot dwell in the same place. So sin is no longer in me because Christ is living in me. So that that sin is now external that brings temptation on on my life, tries to continue to get me to look back to where I was, where before it was part of who you were as a sinful person. See, the the key to victory, uh, Grant Osborne says this, the key to victory is surrendering totally to the Christ who lives in us and drawing strength from the Spirit to defeat the flesh. The key to victory is surrendering totally to the Christ who is in us. Paul writes this in Romans 8, chapter uh, chapter 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh, the old man, have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God because they can't live together. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but as a new creation, you are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed Christ lives in you. Okay? And so we, we have to understand that, that, that this union with Christ, that the old man has to go, the new man comes because of what Christ can do. So now, as a believer, Sin is an extort, uh, outside temptation that comes on us, right? Comes on us. So we're called, we're called to die to our old self. We see the reality of our union with Christ, and what's the next thing? Well, Paul says this, the life I now live. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And now he says, the life I now live. Okay? Remember, he's been crucified. It means he died but now he's alive. So if we're going to live, if we're going to live the new self, what kind of life are we to live? Well, the kind of life that we live are to be no longer driven by self-interest or self-preservation. The life that we as believers are supposed to live when we live in Christ, it's not to be governed by self-interest and self-preservation. Because remember, I is done away with. It's not about me anymore. One of the things, if you ask my children, my, all my adult children, if you ask them, what's the one thing your dad would always say to you? And I guarantee you all four of them would say this, that I would look at them and say, the world does not revolve around you. Right? Whenever they would say, well, I know, I get my, my friends, and I say, well, guess what? The world doesn't revolve around you. It's not about you. If we're going to live this life, guess what? Guess who it's not about? Me not about me. You know why? Because the old Stan is no longer alive. The old Stan has been crucified with Christ. Right? The old Stan is not here anymore. The new Stan is here. The new Stan has Christ living in him. The new Stan is one who is living for him a life of obedience. We no longer driven by self-interest, self-preservation, but by a deep trust in God who loves us and gave his life for us. See, this earthly life and all of its frailty demands that we live this life. Listen, the, the world is not getting better. There's an election coming up, and I promise you, whoever wins, it, it's not, we're not suddenly going to fall in love with Jesus. The world is not getting better. 
better. Because I promise you, there is not a single politician in the world that can save us. Because none of them have ever died on a cross for our sins. That's the truth. Right? That's the truth. So we have to understand that this life is frail. And this life is short. How many know life is short? Right? I honestly, I don't understand how anybody can make it through life without Christ. Right? The things that I've gone through in the last year and a half, right? Losing a spouse, losing your dad, losing your stepdad, that's more than you can bear. How do people make it? Uh, we recently buried a 22 month old child. How does anybody make it without Jesus? And if we understand that life is frail, then we have to realize that it's only by living a life by faith in Jesus and walking in obedience to what he says. Because sin remains a reality. We're not perfect. God is perfecting us, right? But none of us are perfect, right? If we're going to talk about, if we're going to talk about who's the least perfect, I'm, I'm right in front of the line, and I easily admit that, right? It's like, who's the most imperfect here? Put me up front, because that's me. Because I know me, right? And you know you. And when I look in the mirror, I see, sometimes I see Antichrist. Because Antichrist says, I want what's best for me. And then I have to realize, I've been crucified with Christ. I don't live anymore. I don't live anymore. Sin remains a reality, and temptation can seem, you know, God did all these great things, brought them out of Egypt, and when things weren't going their way, what's the first thing they said? Can we go back to Egypt? At least we had food. You were enslaved for 400 years. Well, at least they fed us. That's the mindset. And we see that in, in our life, that temptation is still real in our life. This, the, the, listen, just because you become a follower of Christ and you crucify with Christ doesn't mean the enemy of your soul is going to give up on you. The difference is God didn't give up on you because he loved you so much that he gave his only son. The enemy's not giving up on you because he hates you so much. When temptation, we face temptation, we can remember this in 1 Corinthians 10. Paul writes this, the church in Corinth says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. How many agree to that one there? He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So when temptation's coming, for, the, for those, who are new and, those of us who are, are in the new self, we've been crucified with Christ and we're living through Christ, temptation's still there. The old way of life is still there. The devil wants us to go back to the old way of living, right? He wants us to not live in freedom. He wants the past to be chains in our lives and bondage in our lives. He does not want us to live that way. But we find that a way out only by faith in Jesus. Amen. When we depend and trust solely in him, then we can live out Romans 8, 8 37, which means, which says we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We can overcome the temptations of this life. We can overcome the sinful nature of this life because of who he is and where he is living, which is in me because I have been crucified with Christ. So we are called to die to ourselves. There's a reality of the union with Christ. This union empowers us to live lives of faith and obedience. And then what's the next part? Well, the ending says that the cross, for I've been crucified with Christ, yet I live. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul also writes in Galatians 5, 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. See, Paul didn't just write Galatians 2, 20. The theme throughout all this you'll see is we have to crucify our flesh, crucify its passions. Right? That's what gets us in trouble, right? Is our, is our flesh, our past, those things that we used to enjoy, our flesh enjoyed doing that we no longer can live that way because Jesus has changed us. And it doesn't mean he doesn't want us to enjoy life. In fact, I have found that living for Jesus is the most enjoyable thing in the world because I found the joy unspeakable and full of glory, right? Amen. Joy unspeakable. And I found that the joy of the Lord is my strength. When I am weak, he is strong. He makes me strong. He fills my life with joy, not happiness. Happiness is a temporary emotion. Amen. 
But God fills me with joy, and that joy is unspeakable. See, where once we pursued selfish pleasures, we now pursue with equal passion that which pleases God. So what I want to say to you is some of the things you used to run after with passion when you were in the old way, right? There were things that you used to do, man, it was, it's Friday night, you know, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? The things we used to pursue with passion, the sinful nature, we need to pursue equally because of who God is and what he's done in our lives. It's time for us as believers to be passionate about who we serve, about who we serve. And we need to do that. Luke 9, 23 says this, and then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Daily and follow me. See, we've got to die to our old selves. But it's not a one-time thing. If we're going to make it in this life, if we're going to make it in this world, we're going to follow Jesus, then we've got to daily die to the old self, die to those passions, those things that keep us. So we look at all these things today. We look at all these things. We say, well, Pastor, you said that we're not defined by our past. So what does that have to do with our past? Well, I'm glad you asked that because here's the truth. The truth is this. When we've been crucified with Christ, we're still alive. But it's Christ living in us. We got that? And because of that, because the old me, the old stand is no longer alive, guess what? That means my past is no longer able to have me bound and imprisoned. My past is no longer in control of my life. But here's the sad thing. How often do we live our lives and how often do we see people, and maybe some of us here, and myself included, that that we allow the past to determine our future. We allow the past to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. So many people, well, would you, no, I can't do that because you don't know my past. Guess what? You know what the the psalmist wrote about our past? Jesus said, the, the psalmist wrote and said this, as far as the east is from the west. I got that right. That's east, right? Sunrise, sunset. I got it right. First service, I wasn't sure which way it was which. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed my sins from me. The psalmist also wrote this. He said, he has buried our sins in the depths of the sea. So do you know who remembers your sin? Not God. You do. And the enemy of your soul who likes to remind you, and some of you every day, about your past. And God's up there going, I don't remember. Let's go. Let's go. God wants us to live free. He wants us to break free from our past. Listen, I know there are some things that have happened to you that can hinder you moving forward. I understand all that. I get that. And if you're living your life and there are things that have happened to you in your past and and, and they're, they're keeping you from moving forward, listen, I want to say this to you. Please go get help. Go get counseling. Go talk to a godly man or woman. If you're a woman, a godly woman. If you're a man, a godly man. Go talk to them. They can help you walk through those seasons of your life. And if if your past is your sin, the things that you used to do, if that's what's holding you back, then here's what you need to do. You need to let go of it. Let go of who you were, because it can only bring you down. Here's the truth. If my future's here, and I'm constantly doing this. Guess what I can't see? Where God's taking me. If I'm always looking behind me, I'm going to bump into things. I'm going to knock things over. I'm going to stub my toe, which I do that anyways. That's pretty painful. But if I'm constantly living this life, and I, God says, I want you to do this, and I'm like, okay, God, but remember, remember that about me? Remember when I did this? That's keeping me from And God's like, I've forgotten your past. I forgive you. I've forgotten it. Let's go. So if you're here this morning, you're holding on to sin. You're holding on to who you used to be. You're, you would say, Pastor, if you only knew what I have done, guess what? The one who created you already knows. Amen. 
and he's already forgiven you. So it's not any of my business what you've done in the past. It's his. He's already dealt with that on the cross. You've been crucified with Christ, yet you live, but it's not you that lives, it's Christ that lives in you. So it's time to not, stop being defined by your past. Stop being defined by who you used to be. Because who you used to be doesn't exist anymore because you've been crucified. Would you stand this morning? There are three things real quick I want, I want to share with you about being defined by your past. It's this. One is embrace forgiveness. Embrace forgiveness. You say that's simple, but it's also very hard. It's simple to embrace forgiveness and say, I've been forgiven, I've been forgiven. But it's hard to walk in that forgiveness. Especially if things have been done to you that's hurt you. Right? Especially when you, when you get up in the, in the morning and you're just going through life and, and your father says, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never be anything. That's not easy to get over. Forgiveness is not always easy. It's kind of messy sometimes. But the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ... We need to embrace forgiveness. You have been forgiven of that sin that you're holding on to. You've been forgiven of that sin. It's done. Let's move forward. The second thing is this. Oh, Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. Nobody's condemning you except your past and the devil. So you need to stop condemning yourself. Amen? Second is this. Understand that in Christ, you're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We know this. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. Wait, wait. The old is where? It's gone. And if Paul, if Jesus, if the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write that, he must know what he's talking about. Embrace forgiveness. Remember you're a new creation. The old is gone. And here's the last one. The whole series that we're doing. It's time to begin to live in freedom. Live in freedom. Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. S stop carrying that around on your backpack. Lay it down at Jesus' feet. It's time to move forward. Listen, God has a future for you that is great. And it doesn't matter whether you're in here, whether you're two or 102. Guess what? We sang it this morning. If I'm not dead, he's not done. And I'm a testament to that, in case you're wondering. I'm a testament to that. God's not done with me. God's still working on me. How about you? It's time to lay aside those things. The writer of Hebrews said this. Let us, as believers, let us lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily entangles us so that we can run the race set before us to be like Christ who for the joy set before him endured the cross remember you're his joy he did that for you but it's time for us to lay those things aside and move forward in our lives that's what God wants us to do so stop being a prisoner to the past it's done it's done